convicted sex offender, took the third grader and her stuffed dolphin toy, then buried her alive. I'll help you carry the load. fateful February night at his girlfriend's house and then came home to make a shocking discovery. Remains of our country. Keep an eye on my back. I'll keep an eye on the road. Help me to carry the fire. Friends, today we have a story of a man who was desperate. And I know the question you're gonna ask, why did he do it? It's actually pretty simple, cause he's a fucking moron. You see, in this world, as men, we only have one job, sort your life out. Now, a police report revealed that John Cooey's favorite meal was hamburgers. What's yours? Now, I don't know if he was a pro in the kitchen, but with HelloFresh, their foolproof recipes arrive pre-portioned and easy to prepare in just a few steps. Flavor is in full bloom at HelloFresh. Enjoy the taste of spring with chef-crafted recipes featuring ripe seasonal ingredients delivered right to your door. No more scouring the grocery store for that one ingredient to complete your recipe. HelloFresh takes away all that hassle by delivering fresh pre-portioned ingredients so you have exactly what you need and helps you cut down on food waste. I used HelloFresh and within 35 minutes of opening the ingredients, my meal was ready. Please go to HelloFresh.com and use code TRUERED16 for 16 free meals plus shipping. Link is in the description. But I'm going to start with the background of poor victim Jessica Lunsford who was only 9 years old. It was the dawn of February 2005, a time when families are typically safe within the sanctity of their homes, wrapped up in the peace of night. But for Jessica Lunsford and her family, this tranquility was shattered in the most tragic way possible. The story that unfolded is one of the most heart-wrenching I've ever told. Picture a small town in the United States where everybody knows everybody and the thought of crime is far removed from the daily reality. Nestled here was the Lunsford household where nine-year-old Jessica Lunsford slept peacefully. Her name alone resonated with warmth, a name synonymous with love and joy. She came into this world on a beautiful fall day, October the 6th, 1995, in North Carolina. Her parents, Mark and Angela Lunsford, held her close with a mix of love, relief, and a little miracle, because that's what Jessica was. She was a miracle. You see, she had older siblings, but they were already blossoming into their teenage years by the time she arrived. As for Angela, she had weathered the emotional storm of several miscarriages before Jessica's arrival. So when Jessica was finally born, it was as if the universe was giving them a special bundle of joy. But life as we know it isn't always a bed of roses. Just a year after Jessica's birth, Mark and Angela's past diverged. Yes, they divorced, with Mark getting full custody of the little girl. From then on, it was Mark and Jessica against the world. Their bond, it was something out of a storybook. Jessica was a true daddy's girl and Mark was her hero, her confidant. They were the best of friends, two peas in a pod. Mark, a construction worker, often couldn't afford a babysitter, so instead he made his workplace a playground for Jessica. She would chat with Mark's co-workers, make up games with the wood chips. It was a sight to behold. Everyone fell in love with her radiant spirit. Life took another turn when her grandparents, Mark's parents, decided to move to Florida. Jessica's attachment to them was palpable and their absence left a void in her heart. To fill it, Mark made a decision. They would also move to Florida and live in the same trailer home with his parents. It was a perfect arrangement with Mark being able to help his aging parents and Jessica getting to spend precious time with her beloved grandparents. Life in Florida was an adventure for Jessica. Her grandparents doted on her. They would dine out, go shopping, play games, and even go karaoke together. Jessica held a dream to become a singer, drawing inspiration from her idols, Pink and Shania Twain. She dreamed of the world of acting. 
she fantasized about a career in fashion, inspired by her grandmother, who would take her fabric shopping and sew clothes for her dolls. And that's how she'll always be remembered, a beacon of joy, warmth and love. Now let's get to the events in question. It begins with a spring day in Mark's step. This was no ordinary day for him. This was the day he was going on a date. Mark hadn't ventured into the dating world much since his divorce. He left Jessica in the safe hands of her doting grandparents, knowing they would lovingly tuck her into bed. As Mark enjoyed the night out, his heart lighter than he had been in years, little did he know that the universe was aligning in the most sinister way back at home. The night passed and the morning sun crept through the windows as Mark returned home. Something was amiss. Jessica's alarm was still ringing. Why hadn't she turned it off? His pulse quickened as he made his way to her room, only to be met with an empty bed that seemed to echo his now thudding heart. His mind raced as he searched the house and yard. She was nowhere to be found. He remembered her grandparents tucking her in, but they hadn't seen her since. And then it hit them like a bolt of lightning. Had he left the door unlocked? Could this be? His mind was in overdrive. He racked his brain. Her grandfather had been up around 3am, but he didn't check on her. The weight of that unlocked door pressed upon him. Without a second's delay, Mark's fingers dialed the numbers like a man possessed. He called the police. As he hung up, he felt like he couldn't breathe, but this was no time to lose himself. He had to find Jessica. He began calling everyone, anyone. His voice, rough and urgent, asked if they had seen his little girl. The police, understanding the gravity of the situation, sent out a nationwide alert. The community was shaken to its core. This was one of their own. A wave of volunteers, at least a hundred strong, sprang into action, scanning every nook and cranny. The police, for their part, was systematic. They had to eliminate all possibilities before labelling this an abduction. Had she run away? Was she talking to strangers online? Mark dismissed these suggestions. As the hours ticked by, the air grew heavy with the weight of unspoken fears. The house, once filled with Jessica's laughter, was shrouded in grim silence. In the wake of Jessica's disappearance, the police leaped into action. They tapped into the sex offenders registry, casting a wide net over the area. There were potential threats lurking closer than anyone could imagine, and they were determined to leave no stone unturned. Door to door, face to face, they meticulously interviewed the registered offenders, hoping for a breakthrough, a hint of suspicion, an inconsistent alibi. It was a daunting task. 208 registered sex offenders lived in their vicinity, each a potential suspect. Wow, you dirty bastards. The sheer magnitude of the task was staggering, but they were relentless. Yet, in a tragic turn of events, two people who loved Jessica the most were themselves thrown into the lion's den of suspicion. Mark, her doting father, and her grandfather were drawn into the vortex of the investigation. The men who loved Jessica more than life itself were now considered potential suspects in her disappearance. For three excruciating days, they were grilled, their character questioned, their integrity doubted. Accusations flew. Had they harmed her? Had they given her away? It was an unthinkable, unbearable ordeal. Subjected to the controversial polygraph tests, both men were put through the ringer. The results, though, not entirely reliable, brought a side release. They both passed. In a far-off state, Jessica's mother Angela, estranged for years, found herself yanked back into a past she had left behind. The police reached out, crossing another name off their long list of possibilities. She, too, knew nothing of her daughter's fate that night. The investigation was growing cold. Leads were fizzling out. Hope was dwindling. But just when it seemed like they were walking into a dead end, the officers found themselves at the doorstep of a 46-year-old registered sex offender, John Cooey. John was no ordinary man. He was, in fact, the embodiment of a nightmare and a stark contrast to the innocence of Jessica. Born in 1958, Cooey was a man whose life was marred by a seemingly endless string of criminal activities and poor choices. Even before his name was attached with Jessica, John had a disturbing history of crimes 
that foreshadowed the unspeakable act he would commit. Again, he was a dirty bastard. These crimes paint a picture of a deeply troubled individual with a propensity for preying on the innocence of children. In 1978, Kui was accused of a terrifying incident in which he entered a young girl's bedroom during a house burglary. It was alleged that he placed his hand over her mouth, kissed her and caused great fear and distress. For this crime, he was sentenced to 10 years in prison, but unfortunately he was paroled in 1980. This early release would prove to have devastating consequences in the future. In 1991, Kui's disturbing behaviour continued when he was arrested for fondling a 5-year-old child in Kissimmee. Despite the seriousness of this offence, he was released early due to more lenient laws prevailing at the time. This unfortunate decision allowed him to roam free, posing a continued threat to the safety of children. The year 1997 marked another dark chapter in Kui's criminal history. He was arrested for exposing himself to a 12-year-old girl in Pasco County. This act of indecent exposure demonstrated a complete disregard for the well-being and innocence of a young child. Kui received a sentence of two years of house arrest and three years of probation, but his actions hinted at a deeply disturbed mind. These documented offences paint a disturbing picture of John Kui's predatory behaviour and the potential danger he posed to society, particularly to vulnerable children. Each incident served as a warning sign, an opportunity to intervene and prevent the tragic fate that awaited Jessica Lunsford. And as if that wasn't enough, the law was also hunting him at that time for possession of cannabis. When the police tracked him down, they found that he had abandoned his registered address without a word. That right there was a violation of the most basic rule for sex offenders to inform the authorities about a change of address. The registry was meant to be a leash, but John slipped through like smoke. The officers made their way to a trailer, a humble dwelling where his sister lived along with some other family members. His sister, seemingly oblivious, claimed he'd been staying there, but she had no idea where he was at that moment. John had mysteriously left town, his niece handing him money for a bus ticket to an unknown destination. John's abrupt disappearance, coupled with the airy proximity of his sister's trailer to Jessica's home, was starting to paint an alarming picture. Their instincts were pointing towards John, and so they tracked him down once again, this time at a homeless shelter. John, on being confronted, painted an innocent picture. He claimed to be looking for work, and pleaded ignorance about Jessica's fate, stating that he had no clue about her existence until her face flashed across the news. Despite their gnawing suspicions, the police were unfortunately empty-handed. Without tangible evidence, they had no choice but to let him go. As days turned into weeks, a breakthrough finally arrived. On the 12th of March, a fortnight after Jessica's disappearance, the law finally armed the investigators with a search warrant for John's sister's trailer. The search led them to a chilling discovery. A mattress in the closet held a sinister secret, blood stains. The forensics team was swiftly brought in and the DNA from the blood stains was tested. And there it was, the match that every officer had been dreading and anticipating. The blood stains belonged to Jessica. The horrifying pieces of this tragic puzzle were falling into place. John Cooey, who lived with his sister in a trailer a mere 100 yards from the Lunsford home, had been observing Jessica for some time. Despite his status as a registered sex offender and a criminal past teeming with despicable actions, his movements went largely unchecked due to systemic inefficiencies enabling him to live close to the Lunsford family. John Cooey, their prime suspect, was now a wanted man, his escape and innocent facade crumbling rapidly. He was promptly arrested and charged with the unthinkable, the abduction and murder of young Jessica Lunsford. The relentless pursuit of truth had led a breakthrough, but it was one that came with a bitter cost. In the interrogation room, John began to spin a grim narrative that forever changed the perception of the case. According to him, all he planned was a standard house of burglary. He woke up Jessica. Caught in the act, John was gripped by panic. The sight of his face, he realised he was now imprinted in the nine-year-old girl's memory, which could lead 
to his downfall. He quickly decided to silence her the only way he knew how, through intimidation. Quickly, he clamped his hand over her mouth, instructing her not to scream. With a terror-filled heart, Jessica obeyed him. She was told she had to accompany him, and in that horrific moment, she had no choice but to follow his commands. But as they were about to leave her childhood sanctuary, Jessica made a request. She asked if she could grab her favorite stuffed animal, a big purple dolphin, a souvenir from a fair day with her father. Surprisingly, he allowed her to do so. Once they reached his home, a dreadful scene unfolded. Hidden from the world, John committed an unspeakable assault against Jessica. He detailed how he unfolded two large plastic garbage bags and instructed Jessica to climb in, a beloved stuffed animal accompanying her. He attempted to deceive her with an insidious lie, promising her that he was only going to drop her off at her house. Once there, she could break free from the bags. Yet his true intention was far more sinister. With a cold heart and ruthless intention, John dug a hole almost three feet deep, depositing the innocent girl into its depths. He covered her with the earth she had once played on, then fled, leaving her buried alive in her makeshift grave. Now here's where the story takes an agonizing twist that hits you right in the gut. Picture this. The police, the very embodiment of protectors and defenders, unwittingly became part of the tragedy. You see, they set up a massive tent near Jessica's home, intending to establish a rapid response base to keep the community safe. Little did they know that this giant structure would unintentionally become a cloak, shielding John's sinister act from the prying eyes of concerned onlookers. The odds were already stacked against her, but when the tent standing tall, a glimmer of hope was cruelly snuffed out. When the coroner's team eventually unearthed the body from its dreadful resting place, they found a heartbreaking sign of Jessica's struggle. Two of her fingers had managed to puncture through the suffocating plastic bags, a testament to her final courageous attempt to free herself. Only the skeletal remains of these fingers bore witness to her fight, while the rest of her small body lay in moderate to severe decomposition. The coroner concluded with a heavy heart that Jessica would have to run out of air in approximately one to three minutes after being buried, a suffocating end to her short-lived life, and then began the courtroom drama. The presiding judge ruled that his confession would not be admissible in court as it was given without a lawyer being present, a violation of his legal rights. Yes, as fate would have it, the trial court overturned this decision. The evidence obtained post-confession, all pointing undeniably towards his guilt, would be allowed in court. The crucial evidence included the discovery of Jessica's body, autopsy reports, and the incriminating statements he made while in prison, both to investigators and a jail guard. Given the stir this case had created in Homosassa, it was impossible to find an impartial jury. Therefore, the stage for John's trial was set in Miami. This trial took place March 7, 2007. The charges against John were severe, ranging from first-degree murder, kidnapping, assault, battery, burglary to capital sexual battery. In the courtroom, the defense team presented their case, aiming to cast doubt on the evidence and raise questions about Mr. Cooey's involvement in the crime. They called upon a mental health expert to testify about Mr. Cooey's mental capacity, suggesting that he may be intellectually impaired. Bro, you don't need an expert for that. I can tell you that for free. Yeah, he was a moron. The defense also argued that the crime scene had not been properly secured, potentially leading to the loss of crucial evidence. During the closing arguments, Mr. Cooey's lawyer, Daniel Lewan, urged the jurors to carefully consider the evidence and trust the instincts. Ultimately, the weighty responsibility of determining John Cooey's fate lay in the hands of Judge Richard A. Howard. And finally, the gavel came down hard on John Cooey, delivering the harshest verdict the law could offer. He was sentenced to death. But soon after, nature intervened. On September 30th, 2009, barely two years after his conviction, John passed away due to natural causes. He never really faced the full consequences of his unspeakable deeds. After the heartbreaking loss of Jessica Lunsford, something incredible happened. People came together, fueled by a shared determination to seek justice and create a safer world for our children. In response to this tragedy, lawmakers sprang into action recognizing the urgent need for change. Jessica's Law was born. 
a powerful piece of legislation designed to protect children and ensure that those who commit these crimes against them face stricter penalties. One of the key elements of Jessica's law is the imposition of harsher penalties for those who commit heinous acts against children. Sentencing guidelines were strengthened, ensuring that individuals convicted of sexually abusing children face longer prison terms. So Jessica, in this story, it was a case of wrong person, wrong time. She didn't really have a relationship with John. John was just a dirty, horny bastard. He may have knew of the Lunsford family, but I don't think they had a relationship. He may have seen that little girl here or there, but I don't think he knew her. As I said, he did not know how to sort his life out. And in the end, he took her life. We can all agree the death sentence may have been the correct decision, but I think it's unfortunate he passed away. Whilst God is the best of all planners, I think the best outcome here was for him to suffer in jail by himself for year after year after year. Comment, tell me what you think.